around and are going to tune in. I am uh, very excited for today's broadcast. I have with me a very special friend, uh, which I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, but please, for the presentation today, um, I welcome all comments. So if you have a comment or a question for either myself or Dr. Chen, please put the comments uh, in the comment section and we will get through as many comments as we can. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce my friend and colleague. So let me just get him up here. There we go. Hello, Dr. Chen. Hello, everyone. And I'm going to call you Lou from now on because calling you Dr. Yes, Chen is just strange after weird. working with you for three years. So, <laughs> so okay. So first off, let's. Um, what I want to first find out is um, let's learn a little bit more about you. And because right now you're living uh, in the Toronto area, and you've been in Canada since what year did you come? Was it 2014? 2014. 2014. Okay, yeah, that's right. So, so yeah. why don't you briefly describe for those that are coming on? Uh, just explain sort of how you got here. So, brief history of Dr. Chen. Oh, you should tell me earlier. I don't know how to do that. But that's okay. Uh, very, you don't have to be very very briefly formal. Ish, um, introduce myself. So, uh, I was an intensivist. Actually, graduated and uh, received everything the training in, in China, Beijing. Um, I have become a physician in Beijing Tantan Hospital, I think since 2011. And then I've, I, you know, I visited uh, uh, Italy for one year for like a research uh, fellowship. Uh, and I will return to China again. And in 2014, uh, I contact with Arthur Slasky and uh, come to here to uh, enhance myself uh, to, to, I want to pursue a PhD degree at the University of Toronto here. And then I go to do um, research, um, mainly focus on the research, sorry, the ARDS and the respiratory mechanics. And uh, in 2000, uh, I think 16, yeah, I was very lucky be, to be enrolled uh, to the UFT and I'm in my last year of the PhD program. So my nice. many job <laughs> for now is to do in clinical research. Yeah. And the clinical research. So what first brought you here was contacting Dr. Arthur Slutsky. And if, uh, if any respiratory therapist doesn't know who Arthur Slutsky is, oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'd, I'd be shocked. Uh, but then, of course, we had another physician here in Toronto that uh, obviously you got very well involved with, and that's Dr. Laurent Burchard, yep. and, uh, who is uh, still currently at uh, St. Michael's Hospital doing research, and Lou works under him uh, as well. And we can uh, we'll just show a little... Yes, sure. very sorry. He's my supervisor. I forgot to. Yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> I've mentioned him many times. So this was the uh, this was the group. Uh, I would say what maybe one year ago. Uh, wait, this was before no, the pandemic. This was yeah. probably the end of uh, probably the end of 2019. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you can see uh, Lou there on the left hand side, and uh, I'm behind in the back with my beard and glasses, and then Dr. Laurent Burchard is on the right there. That's so, a beautiful proof that we worked together. Yeah, exactly. There's the proof. <laughs> no, we have we have more proof. We have this too. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. So this is a photograph of uh, Dr. Michael Sklar's on the left, and then in the center is is myself. Sort of, I don't know. I got this lean back going on, sort of leaning back towards Lou, and then Lou is there on the far right. And I've explained to people a couple of times. I think maybe in the Facebook Live that so this was a COVID patient that we were doing a study called the Recruit Study. And we would fill out this, I don't know, maybe 20 page uh, CRF, which is a, basically a form you record all your research data on, but then we can't wipe it down. So <laughs> someone would stand outside of the room and hold up a piece of paper. And then we would basically write the numbers uh, back and forth. And then that paper that's inside the room would just get tossed out uh, and basically, basically just had numbers on it. But it was, uh, it was quite the experience, uh, I must say. And I want to so, clarify that. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. I would yeah, yeah. my only job is taking notes for Tom. You know, Tom is <laughs> taking charge of everything. I was writing, okay, okay, 25 uh, platform. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was electrical impedance tomography study, and uh, I was very familiar with the protocol. And at the time, actually, that we did it, most research had stopped. So many of the research coordinators weren't actually in the hospital. So I think 
I think Mike was actually working clinically at the time. Uh, yeah, he yeah. wasn't even doing research, but we asked him to come in. He's holding drugs in his hand, actually, uh, because so he, he was there to be able to give any any drugs if the blood the blood pressure dropped because we were doing recruitment maneuvers. So that was his main role there. And then yeah, um, Dr. Bouchard hey, wanted us to hand. do this. Yeah, Dr. Bouchard wanted us to do the study. So Lou's like, well, I can write numbers down. I don't really know the protocol that well, but <laughs> you knew it well enough to be helpful as well. So it was good. Now, so far, there's no comments. Uh, I'm hoping there's no comments because I feel like if there are, I'm missing them. Uh, I don't see any. Um, if anybody wants to just say hi in the comments, just so we know that the comments are coming through. Uh, they were coming through. I did a test stream last night, Lou, um, after we had our little test stream. I went on last night just to promote the show today. So if anybody can just make a comment like a, a hello or whatever, just so we can see it, that'd be fantastic. Uh, I do know there's about a 30 second delay from when I say something from when people see it. So what I want to talk about next. Um, so when you, oh, there we go. We got some people talking. There we go. We got some comments. Can you see the comments too, Lou? Yeah. Yeah. Now I can see. Okay. I cannot perfect. say anything, but. Uh, you can see the comments? I can see. No? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very happy. Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the things I want to talk about uh, first off is um, your first, the, so the first paper that I was introduced uh, to you by, so this is the first paper I, I noticed of uh, Dr. Chen, was this one here, which is implementing a bedside assessment of respiratory mechanics in patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. So this pace, paper uh, has many respiratory therapists on the uh, author list, which is, which is fantastic for, for research. So there's Dr. Chen, of course, is the first author, but we have Oris, uh, Connie, we, we've got all these, we got Brian, uh, Carrie, Pam, um, Paul Lindsay, like uh, basically most of these people are respiratory therapists because what this study actually did was have the respiratory therapist, they had predetermined criteria such as um, hypoxemic respiratory failure with a PF ratio less than 200. And basically they were asked to put in esophageal balloons in all of these patients and do a full respiratory system mechanics uh, which included a whole number of uh, items that we would put into this PDF form. And then they would send the PDF form to you, right? And then you collected this data for how, how many years now have you been collecting the data for the registry? Uh, I think it was already six years and we come, we were published very soon. <laughs> That's awesome. <Hopefully. laughs> so based on how many years uh, you've been um, collecting this data, you now have been able to actually look at some of this data. And like you said, you're going to be publishing soon. Uh, have you found anything interesting? Yes, Obviously, I, I know the I, answer, but let's talk about what you found first, and then we'll show some pictures and some graphs. OK, that would be my great pleasure um, to introduce uh, some result. Uh, I'm not very sure. Can you see my screen? Uh, yep, I'm going to bring it up right now. OK. There we go. So what are we looking at here? So it looks like we have four graphs here. Yes, and maybe the font is very small and short. Apologize for that. This is um, for publication purpose, but, but for presentation, maybe it's too small for you. Uh, you know, this uh, study we we in this study we measured the ARDS patient uh, for almost all of them. Um, we put the esophageal balloon and measured the transplant pressure. The first research question, where well, very interesting, is that well, do, you know, we want to know whether the transplant pressure is useful. Because one mm -hmm. of the reason we say that, okay, we know the airway drying pressure is probably the, let's say the strongest predictor for outcome. It's very helpful for our clinic practice. But uh, if you think about the physiology, the airway drying pressure, it's everything applied on the respiratory system, right? And mm -hmm. maybe, you know, from physiology, we think the transplant pressure or the transplant driving pressure should be more related to outcome because that's the only driving pressure applied on the lungs. So yeah, based so on the that, lung field, right? It's the actual exactly. descending pressure of the lung. That's what transpulmonary pressure is. Yeah, exactly. So the first <laughs> research question that we think maybe the transpulmonary driving pressure, okay, it's, it's more important or be better than the airway driving pressure. And then we initiate this study. Uh, but the result is very surprising. So after six years collecting, maybe uh, we have a 350 patients around. We surprisingly found that the average drying pressure, if we use the threshold, let's let's say this is a threshold from the Marcellus Amatos study, a preliminary threshold, it can very well separate the patients. For example, the patient with airway drying pressure lower than 15, they have a much better 
okay, survival probability, then the average ion pressure greater or equal than, uh, sorry, greater than or equal to 15. This is yeah, not that's surprising. A p, that's we a p-value of 0.0036. Yeah, that's very significant, yeah. Very significant. And you see the curve separate very well without overlap at the end. But mm -hmm. we know this, okay? Many, uh, I think, like the long safe uh, uh, study, very large uh, international observation study also suggested that. And yep. the recent study by Eddie Fine on the Lancet Respiratory Care Medicine also support that. We know that. Yeah. So in our study, we have the transplant pressure, right? Mm -hmm. We use a threshold. Also, this threshold, it's debatable, but we, we, we could discuss later. But it's from a uh, um, uh, concept uh, on the esophageal pressure. We use 11 centimeter of water. But we also found that if you have a lower transplant drying pressure, your, let's say, the survival probability is higher than the patients with a high transplant drying pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, unfortunately, the p-value you can see here is it's not so significant, right? Yeah, it's just, we, just we, barely. Yeah. It's very separated a little bit. And mm -hmm. we did also the Cox regression and confirmed that actually the average drying pressure is better than the transformed drying pressure for predicted outcome. Uh, mm -hmm. It was yeah. very surprising. And uh, there can be many questions and you may say, oh, because you don't measure the transform pressure very well, you don't know how to do it. Uh, I think we did a lot of training and, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, effort on that. Uh, but another explanation, and we found it's because uh, maybe, because we think the the pressure, the distending pressure to drive in the chest wall, it doesn't matter, right? That's the rationale. We think only the distending pressure applied on the lung, that matters. Yeah. However, when we did the, another correlation, we found that, the chest wall drying pressure also associated with the disease severity. And you can imagine that this it makes sense. When the patient has a lot of fluid, you know. Oh, yeah, of course. They, you they give a lot of stiff. fluid. Yeah. yeah, more stiff. And they may have a, a big belly because of the abdominal pressure increase. You, sh you could have a higher um, chest wall drying pressure, let's say. The change in the esophageal pressure, okay? Yeah. And we've also found that it was associated with the outcome. So that's actually maybe the bad news for our study, but it's, it's also okay. Uh, but it's definitely good news for clinicians. Yeah. From this point no, of view, yeah, you don't need absolutely, it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah you, you, you use the airway drying pressure, you get the majority, the most important information. And that's yeah. it. And the, the last two figures, I will briefly introduce that. It's a little mm -hmm. bit complicated. Uh, that, as, as you know, the esophagus, esophagus, it's at the point, if you look at the CD scan, sorry, I should show, show that. If you look at the CD scan, the esophagus is at, at the, the position of a, a little bit lower part of the lung. Let's say that's close to the dorsal lung, okay? Yeah. So every time if you measure the esophageal pressure, it doesn't uh, surrogate the global everything in the plural pressure because the plural right. pressure has a gradient. And because of this very interesting position the esophageal pressure you measured when you directly measure it it only represents the local pleural pressure at the dorsal lung okay right. so in this case everybody i think it's probably similar to daniel thomas method that using the uh peep minus the esophageal pressure at end expiration so you got the transplant pressure at end expiration right usually yeah. we want to make it to positive right yeah, you so, want it at least zero or higher, right? Your index yeah, at least uh, at least uh, positive. So that yeah. that way we can say this is what we call end expiratory transplant pressure at the dorsal lung. Okay. Right. Yeah. So we we use this, let's say positive or negative. Uh, we want to say whether they are associated with the outcome because we yeah. usually we think if you have a positive transplant pressure, you should have a better outcome. Uh, frustratingly. This doesn't show any difference. Actually, look you look at this uh, figure; they are pretty right. much uh, similar. Okay. Yeah. So to summarize, I'm just going to quickly yeah. summarize, Lou, for anyone that might be on that's sort of a little bit lost with all sure, the, the numbers yes. and explanations. So the bottom right corner is showing. So what most people understand is tra of with transpulmonary pressure is that at end exhalation, if your pleural pressure is higher than the PEEP level you've set, then you have a negative transpulmonary pressure because the pressure outside the lung is higher than inside and therefore your peep is not high enough to keep the lung open. That's that's the idea. So when you know the pleural pressure, if you set peep to match the pleural pressure, you have a transpulmonary pressure of zero. It's just airway pressure, which is peep and exhalation 
minus pleural pressure. If you match it, your transpulmonary pressure at end exhalation is zero. So in the uh, EPVENT1 and EPVENT2 studies, they targeted a minimum of zero for patients. And if they required more FiO2, they would target slightly higher up to plus six in the EPVENT2 study. What this graph is showing is that whether you have a neutral or slightly positive end expiratory transpulmonary pressure, your outcomes are not significantly different than if you had a negative transpulmonary pressure. So again, leading to the concept that maybe esophageal pressure, at least as we've been using it, is not as helpful as we would hope. And coming from you, Lou, and myself, yeah. this, this is why you say it's surprising because we want, we like transpulmonary pressure. We think it's a useful tool, but it gets harder and harder for you to tell people that they have to measure it when you end up looking at data like this that suggests that maybe it's not as um, n not as directly related to, and again, this is real life data. This is not a strict study. This is just looking at patients that had these measurements done. Um, so it's not following a strict protocol or anything, but very interesting. And then on the left bottom graph is your end inspiratory transpulmonary pressure. And this is the elastin strive ratio, correct, Lou? Like that yes, type of measurement? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to show another picture in the stream. Yeah, we uh, need right a CT now. scan to to expand if you have. Yeah, I'm I'm going to show I'm going to show these pictures here yeah, now below us, Lou. So on the the right bottom of your screen now, this is this explains why we use the elastin derived transpulmonary pressure measurement. So in the EP vent studies, they use directly measured. So just at end inspiration, they take plateau and minus your esophageal pressure at end inspiration, and that's what they called lung stress essentially. What the, paint, what the graphic on the right is showing you, this is work from Takeshi Yoshida, a friend and colleague of, of Lou and mine, that they actually put pleural pressure sensors in teal cadavers, which is an embalming fluid that's a soft fix embalming. So the, the cadavers actually have very compliant tissue. Uh, so they make great, you know, great models for this type of explanation. So they put pleural sensor pads in the ventral region, which is actually the line above. So let me just go over here. This line up here is a pleural pressure sensor in the front of the chest. This is a pleural pressure sensor in the dorsal lung region. So on their back and they're lying supine. And this is the directly measured inspiratory transpulmonary pressure. So this would be plateau pressure minus esophageal pressure at end inspiration. And what this is showing you, and this is what Lou was saying, the esophagus is kind of somewhere in the middle. So the stress that is being measured by your esophageal catheter may not reflect what's happening in the ventral regions. And in fact, this red line is what they showed uh, in the study to be closely, more closely related to what's felt in the front of the chest, which interestingly enough, in ARDS, we have what's called the baby lung. And generally the lung that's open and you're trying to protect is the ventral region. So I think, so this is why we use the elastins derived. And then which threshold we use for years, we've just been telling people, ah, 22 to 24, I guess is okay. Like. No one wants to say a very fixed number, but 22 to 24. So I think it's I think it's great that you have um, you had that data there showing that you know there is a separation between 24. Now the question is, do you have data how that compares to plateau pressure? Because again, if we're saying that maybe esophageal pressure is not as uh, well, I shouldn't say not as helpful, but does plateau pressure does that again, or would you just say you look at driving pressure? Like, should we worry about the plateau pressure limit or would you say driving pressure is more sensitive? Airway driving pressure. Uh, just to briefly summarize everything, the information is simple. We, we really did um, a lot of uh, Cox regression model based on our uh, plan, did the statistic plan. Uh, simple enough is that the airway driving pressure is the winner. That's the, the winner. It's the winner. Yeah. It's, it wins all the partition and mechanics that we say. We, you know, we can partition the mechanics uh, from chest wall and lung. We can also, mm -hmm. from this calculation, we can partition the transplant pressure to the dorsal lung and to the ventral lung. Right. Where whatever game we played, we felt the, the airway drying pressure is still the best, uh, you know, the right. best for them. Yeah. And this, this really supports, this, this supports what, uh, what uh, Amato found in the New England yeah. Journal paper, right? Yeah. That it didn't matter about tidal volume plateau pressure. It depends what the dri driving pressure was really doing. Mm -hmm. So essentially what we could summarize with this, with this concept is that if your plateau pressure was 30 and your peep was 14, your driving, or let's say your peep was 10 and your plateau is 30, you have a driving pressure of 20. Now, if your peep was, let's say 20, 
and your plateau pressure was 34, that patient is probably safe, more safely ventilated. Even though their plateau is 34, they have a driving pressure of 14 versus the person on a PEEP of 10 and a plateau of 30 with a driving pressure of 20. You would probably prefer, like, so should we fixate on plateau pressure still? Or do you think that patient would probably be the one that's probably on a more ideal PEEP setting for that patient? Well, in terms of a PEEP setting, I may also look at the long recordability as you, you have been. Uh, yeah, um, and we're going to talk about that because yeah. people know I've been talking that, about that for a year. That's also <laughs> very important. The, the airway drying project, I think it's a, it's, it's a really good signal for the over distension. And so far, this, the, the data we, we learned, we cannot conclude that, but it seems that the, 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 the priority to protect the baby lung, it's really high. We need to protect right. it without, you know, from the over distension. Right. Uh, but I'm not saying the athletic trauma, which means the reopening, uh, closing injury is not important because nobody can 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 put the, the pip in, sorry, the pip in zero, right? Nobody can do yeah. that. You, you yeah. will cure the patient. So yeah. we'll, maybe by a little bit of pip in many patients, you already heavily added this risk of uh, athletic trauma. And that's yeah. why everything we learned now, oh, the over distension is important. Okay, so mm -hmm. that that's, could be another explanation. I'm not yeah, saying- Yeah, and I, I had this yeah. conversation with uh, Dr. Bushan uh, Katiri yesterday. I, I, he messaged me, we were discussing this and we said, you know, probably, I, so we talked, what do we think is worth? Atelectasis or a little bit of atelect trauma or over distension? And I think more and more data is suggesting that mm -hmm. over distension is really the thing we should be concerned about in terms of what actual impact it has on outcomes. Rather than saying, oh, I don't think my PEEP is optimal. The question is, is your lung being ventilated safely at end inspiration? I yes, think. yes. Okay. I agree. Yeah. So now I'm going to ask you a question, then I'm going to show this picture. Is there anything that could deceive us into thinking driving pressure is really high when in fact there's something else um, causing a problem with how much pressure is required uh, by the ventilator? I'm going to show up a picture and let, let's see if you know where I'm going. <laughs> is there anything that could fool us? <laughs> With uh, driving pressure, yeah, yes, the airway airway closure is it should be assessed it carefully. This is uh, sometimes very, very confusing. Yeah, yeah. Now many people are familiar with pressure volume curves over the years. Uh, we're we're all used to seeing this this lower inflection point that uh, this this was first this this concept of maybe misunderstanding the lower inflection point was actually published in a research letter in the Blue Journal by you. Uh, and basically describing that we, when you have a very clear inflection point, this may not be the point of recruitment as most people would call it. Now, it still does tell you, you sh your PEEP should not be lower than that, uh, but it doesn't tell you that your PEEP is optimal at that level or even slightly above. It still doesn't address, address the recruitability above that level. For example, you could do this maneuver on somebody, a slow flow inflation curve and find that the inflection point happens at 10 centimeter, or let's say eight centimeters of water. That doesn't mean the optimal PEEP is eight centimeters of water if it was only being caused by airway closure. It means that at eight centimeters of water, the airway's open, but maybe they need PEEP of 15 in order to actually have an open lung. And this is where the recruitment to inflation ratio actually helps you to understand if they're actually recruitable or not, because this lower inflection point doesn't, doesn't distinguish recruiters or non-recruiters, correct? Oh, you're muted. Yes, you're right. Ones. Yes, yeah. I try to mute uh, to keep clean your channel okay. <laughs> yeah, it's okay <laughs> yeah so i think so and of course so if you're ventilating someone who has significant airway closure by the time you open the lungs and then ventilate the lungs you may appear to have a very high driving pressure whereas if you increase the peep to this level it should not actually increase the plateau uh, because you actually haven't reached the 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 part of the inflation curve yet so you should be able to increase peep without driving up your plateau significantly and you will reduce driving pressure. So if you ever find patients significantly reduce their driving pressure when you increase PEEP, they probably had some airway closure, but there's easier ways to determine airway closure. And of course, using um, our online calculator um, that I that Lou, Lou helped me to add many of the equations and uh, we have some videos on there as well. I'm actually gonna post a link to it for those who are tuning in that haven't before, but of course the online calculator has some videos at the bottom for people to watch how we do those maneuvers on any ventilator. You don't have to have a slow flow inflation curve on a ventilator in order to actually do these measurements. So, yeah. Okay, so 
let's let's get into the recruitment to inflation ratio. So what exactly is it? Um, I'm going to show a little bit of a picture here. Let me just uh, get a slide up here. Um, I'm going to get a picture up here, Lou, which is the basically a picture of the maneuver, just so that we don't have to pretend like we <laughs> will be able to actually see what's going on. There we go. So let me see if I have a clean. I, I may just come in the, before you close the giant pressure discussion uh, to clarify. Yeah, of course, please. The, the giant pressure we calculated in this study is using plateau, plateau pressure minus the total PIP mm -hmm. rather than the extending PIP, OK? If you oh, use right, the right. okay. uh, uh, metals paper, because they don't have outer PIP measurement. So if you use plateau minus PIP, well, if the patient has airway closure, you could have an even higher bias on this um, calculation on the joint pressure. So right. what we did is minus the total PIP. I think I prefer to doing that. It's uh, At least it's. Uh, Right, it's, so it's you're smart. not just doing an inspiratory hold to determine plateau pressure. Yeah, we, we you're mentioned doing plateau. An, you're, you're also doing an expiratory hold to determine any uh, potential auto peep. Yeah. Okay, so let me share my screen again. Window, here it is. All right, let's get this up here. So what we have here is, um, I'm trying to find a better way to do this. There we go. That, <laughs> was, that's okay. Switch that's my big home. enough. Yeah, that, that's, that's big enough for people to see. So well, let me try one more here. Let's see. Now that's fine. Now they're both the same size. Okay. So here we have, this is a graphic basically explaining how to do the maneuver to determine the recruitment to inflation ratio. But maybe what I'll do beforehand is we'll bring up another picture here that I have that kind of describes the principle of what we're doing. So let me put this full screen and I'll describe this, Lou, and then we'll talk about how, how you did the study and sort of any um, like interesting um, stories you have in terms of how, how you yes, please. were able yeah. to accomplish it. So basically, if you want to assess recruitment in a patient, one of the, I would say, reference methods, would you call it, Lou, or like a gold standard method would be multiple PV curves. Would that be a good way to call it? Like maybe not a gold standard, but... Uh, I, it would be I, considered I think so. a reference method. Um, yeah. Some some people may think the golden standard is CT scan CT because scan, yeah. Luciano Gattinoni is so famous. I, I I like his wrist study for sure. But mm. before when he proposed that method, he used the PV curve to validate. Okay, to yeah. to support his research. So right. the PV curve is the oldest, to be honest. Right. And let's be honest, sending a patient for CT scan just to assess bedside recruitability yeah. is not, it's not really, it's not I mean, yeah. I think Luciano Gattinoni has a CT scan beside his ICU. Like it seems every study <laughs> he does, there's CT scan. So it's not quite feasible as a bedside tool. Yeah, but it's so, very intuitive. We, yes. It's the best uh, way to show. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a multiple pressure volume curve, essentially what you would do is you would do a pressure volume curve against slow flow inflation. The reason why this says elastic airway pressure is because you would use very slow flow so that you don't have resistive pressure. So we're talking like five liters per minute of flow going into the lung, okay? And this basically creates a compliance curve. That's, that's all it is. It's mils per centimeter of water. You have a compliance curve. So this shows you the compliance of the lung from this PEEP level up here. Now, if you increase PEEP to 15 and redid the maneuver, if the patient did not recruit anything and nothing really changed. What would happen is it would continue along this linear slope and eventually you would over distend and it would probably start to curve towards higher pressure, less volume because you have that upper inflection point. But it would technically continue along that because it's your compliance curve and your compliance is not changing during this. But of course, once you go on the higher peep, it will continue until the lung becomes stiff, then it changes. But if you redid the maneuver and all of a sudden your baseline was shifted up here, this tells you that you have actually recruited volume within the lung, and we call this the recruited volume. So there's an increase in end expiratory lung volume that was above what's predicted. So what's predicted? Well, if I know my mils per centimeter of water, if I increase my PEEP from 5 to 15, that's an increase in 10, you would multiply 35 by 10, and you'd get 350 mils. That would be the expected increase in volume from this PEEP level to this PEEP level. Anything more than that is considered the recruited volume. So rather than doing multiple PV curves at the bedside, Luke came up with this fantastic idea of why don't we start with a peep up here and drop the peep down to here and let's measure the volume that we lose 
and then figure out if there was more than what's predicted by this pressure volume curve. Did I do an okay job, Lou? <laughs> I know you muted your microphone again. Much better than me. So okay. I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> well, how to, to be how honest, to I've, been next time. Yeah. I've been explaining this now for uh, <laughs> too many years. Okay, so essentially, rather than doing multiple PV curves, we have now this option to do, we start at PEEP of 15, and we drop the PEEP, and in, in one step, you observe the loss in volume that occurs when the PEEP goes from 15 to 5. So you do this in one maneuver. You don't do it slowly. You have to have a full 10 centimeters of water uh, drop. So you're basically adjusting your expiratory driving pressure. So that breath just, whew, there's no there's no PEEP holding it there anymore. There's a, a increase in flow and volume that exhales out of the lung. You'll see a spike in your exhaled flow as well. And then as this go down, what's expected to come out the ventilator, meaning if you look at the exhaled volume, what you're expecting to see is a combination of hopefully three things, if not at least two things. The first thing you're going to see is your exhaled volume from high PEEP because you just gave a breath, so that has to come back out. Then you're going to lose what's predicted. And again, this is what would be predicted based on the compliance of the lung at the lowest PEEP level here. So you're expecting that as well. Anything more was volume that was added to the lung beyond expected, therefore recruited parts of the lung. And this volume, we take this mills and divide it by the drop in pressure to get the compliance of that recruited lung. And then we take that compliance, let me just go on. We take the compliance of the recruited lung, which is recruited volume divided by PEEP minus PEEP low. And then we divide that by the compliance of the respiratory system. We call that the inflated lung at the low PEEP level. That ratio is then called the recruitment to inflation ratio. And 0.5 or higher means your patient has an increased potential for recruitment. And I usually describe to many people, Lou, and I'll let you comment on this in a moment, but the threshold is kind of something that the journal really wants you to do when you publish a paper, but it's not, it's not exactly like, um, it's not a fixed. In other words, if someone's 0.49 and someone is 0.51, they're probably very similar uh, in terms of their lung uh, mechanics or what's going on within their lung. But, you know, when you publish a paper, they really like the threshold. They want, they want, they want to know, right? Like, you know, <laughs> You're right. They, they really, they really wanted the threshold. So you pick 0.5 based on its ability to distinguish recruiters and non-recruiters to the best that you could in terms of like with your data, correct? Yes, this, this is a very important mm -hmm. point, as you said, but in real life, everybody likes to do it. When we, you know, distribute the vaccine, you decide the, let's say, some postcode like uh, my neighborhood, let's say L4C, they can receive the vaccine. But just mm -hmm. one street, just one street close to them, you're not allowed. Yeah. It's right. the same thing. Of course, this is not perfect, but in the yeah. you know real real life practice, we they need a threshold to to help them to to decide, make a decision. Yeah. Let's say, but uh, always keep in mind that it's a continuous variable. And yeah. 0.49 doesn't mean any difference, I think, for yeah. me. It's a, spec it's a spectrum. It's yeah. a spectrum of recruitment potential. Exactly. Right? It's a, it going from no recruitment potential, yeah. so you could have a number of zero, yeah. to you know, as high, as high so, as you've seen. So the so, concept is help you to balance, let's say, the benefit, which what you want to achieve is the nominator recruitment, mm -hmm. OK? And, right. the, and with the denominator. Denominator is how much volume you deliver, deliver to the baby lung. And uh, right. you may concern about this uh, can cause hyperinflation, right? Yeah, yeah. So very cool. Now, for those who uh, aren't aren't familiar with the the paper, let me just go back to our slides here. So this is the uh, the paper here. I just took that graph. So that airway opening pressure graph that I showed you earlier is actually from the same the same paper. Uh, let me put it full screen because it's a little small. Um, but this this is on the. Um, the Blue Journal, so the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. If you hear me say Blue Journal, this is the journal I'm referring to. Uh, so potential for lung recruitment estimated by the recruitment to inflation ratio in ARDS, uh, a clinical trial. So this trial, let, talk a little bit about the trial, Lou, in terms of like any things that, any interesting things you found or any difficulties. Uh, how, how long did it take you to do the trial? Just stuff like that. T tell us how research works <laughs> in, in a small, <laughs> like just des describe how long it took you, any challenges, et cetera. Well, um, I think this study originally initiated is from uh, 2015. Um, but I can tell you to doing research, it's probably if you did it before, and clinic research, you know, always people is more important than any protocol. 
I would say with the help with the artists from um, at St. Mike Hospital, I don't have any difficulties. Right. Because everything I ask, they, they help me. They, they yeah. always give me, you know, persistent support. So I'm very happy to do that. Every time we have the patient, we manage together, we discuss with the clinic team if we need some paralysis, or well, clinicians will give it, and uh, I, I had a no no barrier with this study. It's very, See, very I had, nice. I had a feeling that was going to be, that's why I asked you that question, because what I wanted to point out is that the the institution that Lou is working at and doing research is St. Michael's Hospital. Um, you know, we they've coined the term, you know, Center of Excellence in Mechanical Ventilation, but really we include all the work in Toronto because we all work very closely with other researchers in Toronto, but there is such, um, there is such, huge support for research in that uh, in that whole city. So University of Toronto essentially is so supportive of mechanical ventilation research that as, as Lou mentioned, doing a research study in a hospital that is very, um, you know, known for mechanical ventilation research basically means there's no difficulties. Uh, so the respiratory therapists are familiar with research. They're very helpful. The clinical team is very helpful. They're all aware of what you're doing. Um, they have people that are, you know, good at getting consent from patient families, et cetera. So it's very feasible. So obviously the environment you're in is very helpful for doing research. Now, this recruitment to inflation ratio has now led to a randomized control trial, which I'd like to talk about. I've mentioned it many times, um, like prior to having you on, but we have the careful ventilation in ARDS. So let's talk about how long this took just to get off the ground. First off, just to get going, because I think that was more challenging uh, because when the pandemic hit, <laughs> right when we were about ready to go, the pandemic hit and that sort of caused a little bit of issues. But then we we pivoted a little bit, right? Because the study has sort of changed a little bit in terms of how we're analyzing the data. So talk a little bit about caveats for people. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so the caveat trial is we supported by the CIHR and the UFT. Uh, it's exactly the trial we want to test whether first, we if we set the PEEP based on recruitability and we limit the airway drying pressure and we limit, you know, the PO1, it's the another index uh, for assess the respiratory drive or effort. If we yeah, limit the P0 this, dot one, yeah, yeah, yeah I've talked about that many times. Yeah. yeah, parameters. Can we provide a better outcome to the patient? Improve the outcome? Uh, mm. We don't know, right? Uh, the R ratio Tom talked about many times. I think it makes sense. Many people think it makes sense in physiology, but uh, we always need to test in the clinic trial and like this uh, randomized trial whether it works. Yeah. So that's the target for our trial, and it went uh, very. Um, Smoothy and uh, actually we we enrolled uh, more than 170 patients just in maybe few few months Yeah, um, I feel like when we were about to launch the trial I, I say we only because I was at the hospital when everything was getting ready to go mm -hmm. uh, I feel like We you know, we were getting very very close and then all of a sudden it was Research had to stop we're like, but wait, this is ARDS research So then we had to sort of write sort of uh, amendments to the protocol to say, okay, well we would like to actually study COVID-19 because this is the perfect population to do it in uh, because many of them present with ARDS. So then now we're doing uh, what we call it a, there's a basket trial. So essentially a trial within a trial. So we're trying to collect enough information to have um, the ability to look at patients with COVID and non-COVID. But I think the majority of the patients right now, just because of the environment we're in in the world globally are COVID patients, if I'm not mistaken. There's very few that are non-COVID enrolled right now, correct? Yes, you are, you are completely right. Yeah. Yeah. So now I've been pushing this recruitment to inflation ratio since the beginning, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. We posted it on our blog in terms of, you know, explaining and Tom, to people. If, if this try is negative, we quit our job immediately. I know. We have to go We're in done. hiding, yeah. right? We have to <laughs> <laughs> so, this, so this is the point I was going to make. You mentioned we need to prove it. Both yeah. you and I have used transpulmonary pressure for years to guide mm -hmm. clinical practice. And yet the evidence is not like in the large randomized trials, they didn't perform as people would have expected. It was actually quite surprising when EPVent2 was published that we found that, well, if you compare it to a high PEEP trial, there's no difference. But when that happened, I was starting to learn about recruitability from you 
I read Gatnoni, but I find that I like your, your stuff was, was interesting. It was more applicable at the bedside because I didn't have a CT scan in my back pocket. I have electrical impedance tomography, but that wasn't the same at the time in terms of assessing recruitability. I didn't know enough about it to, to use it. So anyways, I learned a lot about recruitment potential from you and it came down to, okay, well now we do need to prove it. Um, and you could, you could think that recruitment potential is part of the reason even why EP event two was not successful, something that's so, so based on physiology, transpulmonary pressure, but there's two reasons why that, that study may not have been as, as magical as we were hoping. One, the expiratory transpulmonary pressure, when you try to match it, well, you showed that you, you have some data suggesting it didn't really matter, but when you match PEEP to transpulmonary or esophageal pressure to get a neutral transpulmonary pressure, you are assuming recruitment potential. You're assuming the lung is going to magically respond to that. So what do they do instead? They measure the inspiratory transpulmonary pressure to see if it's safe. However, they had an inspiratory transpulmonary pressure threshold of 20 centimeters of transpulmonary pressure. And I think this was a huge, because this means if you yep. set zero and your limit is 20, your driving Driver transpulmonary pressure could be as high as 20 centimeters of water. And you showed data showing that you know, if you if you look at transpulmonary pressure, less than or more than 11, it does separate, right? So it wasn't as sensitive as driving pressure, but it clearly separates and that's at 11. So imagine 20. I mean, if you were comparing 20 to 10, I think you'd see a huge change. And so we have reasons to understand physiologically why the study was not as magical. So it's a very good point. Yeah. Because a, a transpulmonary pressure 20, okay, it's yeah. it means Seriously, your, your lung is closed, but not reached to the total lung capacity. And it means your airway drain pressure is approximately, usually, 25 centimeters. Of course, Correct. that really kills. Yeah. 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 And they weren't controlling for driving pressure in the study. Yeah. They were allowing some patients to have plateau pressures of 40, 45, because the transpulmonary pressure was less than 20. But again, allowing it up to 20, I think, was, was a problem. So we've learned physiologically that that's different. The other thing with studies that I've mentioned a lot in the last year, and I think you'll agree, and this is why you included it in the caviars, is that once you wake somebody up, mm. there's a lot of noise. I think there's so much noise in clinical trials once people wake up, because what's not typically managed after the fact are dyssynchronies, excessive patient effort, inefficient patient efforts, um, dyssynchronies of those kinds, but especially high effort or low effort is not monitored in any of these trials. So it, again, it's really a noise that's introduced into the trial process that has not yet been done systematically. So what you did with caviars is fantastic. Once they wake up, we're monitoring effort and drive um, to ensure that it's safe and acceptable range. So. Yes, that's, that's another very important point. I think Marcelo Amato published a comment on that because of the lot of synchrony for the art trial also caused a lot of problem. Yeah, he did. Yeah, there was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think was it a letter or was it just part of the? Uh, I was think it part of the supplement? I can't. I think it's a commentary. I've seen something. his pictures, but it was a, yeah. there was a commentary that he published on it mm -hmm. where he had he had examples. Again, this was, obviously there was over a thousand papers and or patients enrolled in this in the study, um, but what they did is he looked at just tracings he had of random patients and there was so much breath stacking. Um, and so obviously breath stacking is going to introduce a huge amount of noise into a study because you obviously have potential for injury. You have patient discomfort, dyssynchrony, et cetera. Um, but so there is a question before we move on to yep. something else. Um, someone says, uh, how, are, how are you monitoring effort and drive in these patients? <clears throat> wow. This app is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in, in our trial, you know, initially when this trial was designed, um, we tend to use the transpulmonary drying pressure. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you need the esophageal balloon and you can everything see- Everything was transpulmonary, transpulmonary pressure in the beginning, right? Like yeah, we everything gonna, is transpulmonary pressure. We were gonna limit everything yeah. based on the transpulmonary pressure data, yeah. And, uh, but I think eventually we found that maybe this is not very feasible for our clinic trial, particularly in the COVID-19 patient, and realized that uh, maybe we just use a very old uh, but really, it works the simple index called the PO1. I know Tom mentioned many times. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, you can measure this PO1 in almost all the ventilators. And uh, it's very simple. And we try mm -hmm. to limit this PO1 
let's say less than a, a four four centimeter of water to to avoid excessive dry. Yeah. And some ventilators, it's a maneuver. So you have to go in to find yeah. where the maneuver is and it performs a maneuver. And what the P0.1 is, it's the first 100 milliseconds of the trigger. It's how much pressure is generated, basically how much how much pressure drop there is in the first 100 milliseconds. And it represents the drive. So they're limiting it to four um, in that trial. And then if it's above that, they have different things to try to minimize the drive. One is addressing the patient's saturation. So if they have a low saturation, you want to give them enough oxygen that oxygen's not forcing or in, in, involved with their drive. And then additionally, uh, adjusting PEEP possibly to, to reduce some of that P0.1. And then the last ditch effort would be sedation. Uh, but we're trying not to just can always use sedation without looking at other elements that can affect drive. So that's how and, they're doing it in the trial. And just a brief comment also about the, the drive, you know, uh, since I think uh, many years ago, we, we sometimes do a occlusion by ourselves and to see the patient generate negative effort. Yeah. And we try to measure this swing. Uh, I know the um, you can you can use this occlusion pressure, but uh, um, I prefer PO one because PO one has a very beautiful part. It it only calculated the uh, occlusion pressure during the first one hundred milliseconds, and mm -hmm. because this is very short, the patient is not able to change their drive. You know, right? So, yeah. but if you do a manual occlude. You can, yeah. the patient always know it and they will generate higher. Yeah, I actually drive talked about this. Yeah. I talked about this last night. It takes about 0 oh, 0.3 really? seconds. Yeah, it takes about 0 0.3 seconds for the brain to realize there's no flow. And someone will instantly increase their drive in the middle of the breath if there's no flow after 0 0.3 seconds. Mm -hmm. This is why uh, proportional assist ventilation, they use a point in on the Covidian ventilator for PAV. It does a 0 0.3 second pause. It doesn't exceed that because the patient will then know and they'll be uncomfortable. But yeah, Mich um, Michelle Bertoni and Ewan Gallagher, they published that paper looking at the PIOC and that they found that, yes, if you measure the full drop, it is definitely higher than what normal effort is. And in fact, they have an equation for assuming what P must, what normal P must would be, or at least a non-excessive P must would be using that. But the P0.1 is very, uh, very consistent, a very nice tool. Mm -hmm. And one of the, um, I've been asked this question a few times when people say, um, what if your P0.1 is, is high, but you do an occlusion pressure and it's low. And I think the simplest answer, Dr. Gulliger actually answered this question on Twitter. He said, if the patient has diaphragm dysfunction, it may not affect their drive as much. So the P0.1 can be high, but then your PIOC looks totally normal just because they don't have the strength to make that increase in drive. Um, but the P0.1 would be more accurate in that case. So, so I think it's a good choice that you use P0.1 in the study and not other measures because it does seem to be sort of a tried and true traditional measure, measure of drive that's been used for years. So last question, Lou. We know we have to wait for the study to know whether or not using it in a protocolized manner actually changes outcomes. But do you have any data to suggest that someone whose PEEP is set according to their recruitment potential actually makes any difference at all or could be beneficial or could be harmful? Do, do we know? I know the answer, but I'm leading up to it. So why don't we share, <laughs> share another slide? I see you've prepared it here. So I'm just bringing it up on the screen now. Yes, thanks. There we go. OK, I, I may first uh, explain what these two curves, survival curves, are. Uh, so you know, we measured the R, estimate R ratio in our registry patients uh, around, I, I forgot, uh, 300, 260, something like that. Um, and then we can estimate the recruitability, right? And we can separate the patients then by two groups. One group is we called they are clinic people. It's matched with the recruitability, right? Example, so if they're recruitable, if they're recruitable, yeah. they're on a higher level of PEEP, and if they're not recruitable, they're on a lower level of PEEP. Exactly. So it means yeah. your clinic PEEP it's set exactly in the same direction of the long recruitability. Perfect. Whereas yeah. some patients, uh, their clinic PEEP it's in the wrong direction. Let's say not wrong, but different direction. Okay, we don't know right. if it's wrong yet. So low recruitability, yeah. high PEEP, or high recruitability, low PEEP, obviously that's a mismatch between what they, again, the spectrum of PEEP is similar to the spectrum of recruitability, but they're in opposite directions in this patient population. Exactly. Right. So we found that patient, if they have a matched recruitability and PEEP, they have a better outcome 
Then the patient with mismatch recognability and PIP. As shown you compared here is the log rank test. Uh, it's significant. It means their survival is higher in this yellow survival curve. So this is a very um, a good news for us to continue this try. And uh, of course, we have to continue because now we have funding. <clears throat> <laughs> um, yeah. But I think we, we have a hope to, to, um, to show something uh, hopefully uh, positive in the future. But uh, as you know, the clinic trials is complicated and uh, mm -hmm. let's see in the future. Yeah. Yeah. No, I thought, I mean, so I actually, the first time I saw this data was before we went live. So Lou shared with me this graph and I said, this is exactly the kind of information as a respiratory therapist, you want to know if someone's saying we should try this, try this. The question is like, okay, am, am I doing harm? Like whether or not you're doing benefit is one thing, but am I harming the patient by doing this? And I think if anything, this data looking at years of patients with ARDS, not specifically COVID, but you're representing data from like, how many patients is included in this analysis, Lou? In this analysis, uh, the yeah. specific is 264. 264 patients. Yeah. So 264 <clears throat> patients that had recruitment to inflation ratio or in recruitment to inflation ratio measured. And we know their PEEP data, we know all their data we can at least hope and understand that we're clearly not causing harm. I think there would be a very clear this signal. This is an association, yeah. Yeah, so this is association, but there's no association with harm. The association mm -hmm. is no. with benefit. It's not causal, we don't know. That's why we're doing a randomized trial to see if we can rule that out. But clearly um, there's a good signal here. And uh, you know, um, uh, sometimes you have a low recruitability, let's say low R ratio. And uh, you may say, okay, I use a lower PEEP. You, you may feel not very comfortable. But really, we didn't see this harm because we see the mortality in the subgroups. And mm -hmm. this gives a great opportunity for the clinicians to lower, the, for example, the, the vasopressors. Because yeah, they, vasopressors, they, you yeah. Use, yeah, vasopressors, thanks. You, you, can, yeah. you can use a lower PEEP. You can have less hemodynamic uh, uh, negative yep. impact on that. And that, that hemodynamic impact, I think, and I could be wrong, you can correct me, but I feel mm -hmm. like sometimes when you lower PEEP, you may not instantly see the hemodynamic impact change um, that you will later. Like it's not, it's yep. not always instant. Like you turn PEEP down, blood pressure just shoots up. It, it's not, <laughs> I don't think it's usually as simple as that. No, I no. think if you're going to see it, it's uh, uh, also very complicated. Yeah. Yeah. It's very complicated. So I think sometimes when we adjust PEEP, we expect, you know, we look at the blood pressure. Now, when you go too high, for sure, you can see a drop that comes down. But when you make a PEEP change and you don't see it go up, it, it doesn't always work. It's not always, uh, it's not like turning a switch on. <laughs> like you don't just turn off the switch and the blood pressure shoots up. I, I think we have to understand that, that, you know, you may need to reassess in an hour and go, wow, look at that. We're now turning down the vasopressors. Um, so let's get to a couple of questions before we end, Lou. Uh, I'm going to get rid of that and we're just going to call up some more questions here. Um, so there's a question. Um, did you look at all in terms of, like, did you separate at all patients with considered like, um, um, primary or extra pulmonary ARDS? Uh, in my paper? Yeah, like in the in the registry um, that's, data, that's are you collecting? definitely fa fantastic question. I understand the, your your point, and, and I think this is very interesting because you may you may suspect that if I'm not wrong, the mm -hmm. AID, sorry the pulmonary ARDS have different lung recruitability than the extraordinary pulmonary ARDS. Uh, we didn't do this specific analysis because one of the reasons it's very tricky to define first what is mm -hmm. pulmonary and what is extraordinary pulmonary. Pa patient could have a double risk factor and uh, it's it's very a little bit uh, arbitrary to to define yeah it may um, not be black or white in terms of extra exactly. pulmonary or pulmonary yeah but i'm not sure people uh, are familiar with the live try uh, published on um, last year sorry 2019 on the lancet respiratory care so they they use the you know the x-ray to predict mm -hmm. the and the CT scan to predict the lung recruitability Right? right. So they say if your X-ray based on the focal, based on if there were focal opacities and stuff. Exactly. Right? Yeah, I if it's that diffused, you, mm -hmm. they predict that this patient is highly recruitable. They put a right. high PIP. If it's focal, they use a low PIP. Okay. Right. This try, unfortunately, it's negative because they have a lot of misclassification. Twenty-one yeah, percentage. Yes. The yeah, reason is yeah. it's very difficult to judge on the even X-ray. So this definitely it's very subjective, right? It's very yeah, subjective. It's even subjective. Yeah. 
But we found in the uh, ongoing study, we use X-ray, we use quantitative analysis on the X-ray. Mm -hmm. It's very nice. Usually the patient has diffused uh, X-ray. They, they, they have a higher uh, R ratio. To there is a, ratio yeah. Yes, there is a correlation. But uh, during clinic practice, you could suspect that. But I would still right. suggest you to measure the recruitability because uh, suspicion sometimes is not reliable. This this is very... Some patients, they have X-ray, or you may say this is a focal or diffuse. I don't know. It's it's right. very hard. But there is a correlation. Overall, there's a relationship. There seems exactly. to be a similar similarity. So based yeah. on this question, maybe there, there is an um, association, but I didn't test it because just because I'm not confident to, to define that. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Another question here, Lou. How often should the RI be assessed, and how often do you challenge the PEEP setting? In... At Samaika Hospital, as you know, Tom, uh, mm -hmm. once the patient is intubated, they measure it uh, almost every day until the patient get to recover spontaneous breathing. You don't need it anymore, right? right? Yeah. And, I and it's not necessarily accurate if they're breathing. They won't really tolerate exactly. the maneuver most of the time. Exactly. Yeah. Once per day, or usually it's okay once, but they don't, they don't change too much during one day. But I will strongly repeat your measurements every time you change the position, body position. Mm -hmm. We published a paper uh, last year uh, uh, in the COVID-19 patients. We shown that every time you rotate the body, okay, mm -hmm. like cooking an egg, you change Prone, the yeah. lung recruitability <laughs> very, very yeah. rapidly. And the yeah. lung recruitability, oh, every time you pull the patient, the IR ratio goes higher, much higher. It means uh, uh, lots of uh, recruitment. And then goes mm -hmm. down, goes down, goes down, goes down. And yeah. this well, I think because once, yeah. once the lung opens, yeah. There's nothing left if, if, if as long as the lung stays open, then there's nothing there recruiting. But I think, um, yeah, because I was asked this question recently, it might even been last night. Um, should you re redo the measurement after proning the patient? Yes. And the yes. answer is yes, you should. Um, but I think you and I discussed once, you probably should wait a little bit. Like if you do it immediately, it may not represent how they settled mm -hmm. out because there's a lot of movement of secretions when you first exactly. prone somebody yeah. or put them supine. So I recommend at least an hour, but if you could do two hours, it would be probably easier if you're taking care of the patient to leave and come back two hours later rather than come back one hour later, especially if they're isolated. So, you know, at least one hour between doing before doing your RI ratio after you've turned the patient will probably have more accurate results. So, so that question was actually from YouTube. So that's cool. So I know that our, I'm streaming to Facebook and YouTube at the same time. So that's cool that it's, uh, it came from there. Um, I'm just going to look up, make sure we didn't miss any other questions. I don't see any more. But I'll give a few moments for people to ask a few other questions. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Lou? I'm, I'm going to put this picture back up because it's just a fun picture of us hanging out. But <laughs> for those who missed the beginning of the, of the broadcast. Did you get a, so, any other question? Can I, uh, no. I'm not sure no, I can not, see. Okay. Not, not yet. Not yet. No. So in terms of... Um, in terms of ongoing research, this is really your main project. Is this actually part of your PhD as well, or is your PhD the registry? Uh, the the caveats, no. The caveats is uh, we we applied doing the, my PhD, but uh, I, I I will continue that. Yeah, the the so PhD which is, is my registry. Uh, yeah, that's and what I thought. Yeah. Ratio, yeah, yeah. So, so hopefully that's, that's I, I very... can publish this very soon. And uh, we have a lots of lots of uh, interesting data on the lung mechanics and the chest wall mechanics to. I think it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'll, and regarding, I'll add, yeah, go ahead. Please go ahead. <clears throat> no, please go ahead. And regarding the R ratio again, um, I think it's, uh, you, you may emphasize many times it, it's important to assess the airway closure. Um, yes. sometimes you may find the patient have zero D recruitment volume. It's just because the patient has a very high airway opening pressure. When you reduce PEEP, you don't really change anything. Um, the, the airway already closed. Um, it's not. Um, it's not so rare. The airway closure, I have to say, is around twenty-five to uh, one third of the patient they may have it. This is actually like a protective mechanism, because every time you mm -hmm. try to empty your lung, you say, <sighs> you go to the rest of the lung volume. You cannot complete empty lung because your small airway is closed. It helps. Right. Help, it helps. So in the area patient, they have a very low um, lung volume, and this, um, and particularly, they have a lot of fluids. Some patients, uh, th mm -hmm. this can happen. Yeah. Yeah. So in the recruitment to inflation ratio paper, you had forty-five patients, correct? Yes, forty-five. 
And exactly how many had airway closure? Had airway closure. Fifteen patients. Had yeah, airway one closure. five. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's not, it's not, but I, I remember, I remember you saying that. And then I remember us when we started looking for it routinely in all the patients, you were like, w why does no one have airway? Because many patients, just depending on, you know, when you're looking, wouldn't have airway closure. And then you'd have a number of patients come in, oh, airway closure, airway closure. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's almost like it's completely unpredictable when, when you're mm -hmm. going to find it. Uh, someone sent me a picture uh, yesterday. Let me see if I can bring it up. Um, there's no patient information on it. Uh, and he, he was in the chat earlier. Um, but you'll be excited to see, uh, this Lou, this was sent to me. So let me just, uh, save the image. I will download it and open it. And so this was sent to me in a Facebook messenger last night. Let me bring it up on the screen. And let's show it here. So check this out. <laughs> <laughs> so How much is this, that? Uh, but eighteen. So Ooh. let me let me go let me go full screen with this. So yeah, so this was sent to me, and essentially, oh, so you're all right. this you is, have a date on there as a proof. What's that? The date. Proof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The <laughs> date. There you go. So yeah, it was a few days ago. Uh, so he sent me this, um, and yeah, you can see there's a slow flow inflation curve. So there's mm -hmm. five liters per minute. I shouldn't say curve, but slow flow inflation maneuver, just using volume assist control. Again, there's a video describing exactly how to do this on the RT Maven website. And you can see there's low flow going across. Looks like they use seven, which mm -hmm. is fine. Anything less than nine, I think, is acceptable. Not big deal, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you have slow flow inflation, and then you have this, this rapid increase in pressure and then this very clear inflection that just all of a sudden it's going in completely different direction. Um, so this this is I, an example. I would of, also of comment on here. If you look at the airway pressure, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at the part in the initial part, which is from zero to eighteen centimeter forward, yeah. You you look at the curve; it's almost linear, like a fake yeah. one. Yeah. Usually you find this only on the test run, okay? Yes. Like a fake run, fake run. But once you exceed that, you 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 see some fluctuation. Yes, and yep. that's the too long. Because yeah, and sometimes that, you see fluctuations because exactly. of alveoli before opening, that, and sometimes cardiac oscillations. But you'll see none of that here. Exactly. So that that's another uh, point to, for for you to identify the airway opening pressure. Before that, you don't see any fluctuation. It's just yep. because you are just inflating the curve and some air compression. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was very cool. So he he sent me that, and I thought I thought that was uh, that was pretty cool. So here's another question from YouTube. We have: uh, Would you check for AOP on every intubated patient? Uh, for ARDS, uh, yes, we we do this yeah. uh, routinely in, at, at clinic practice. Yeah, and it's yeah. simple. Actually, to be honest, um, if it's complicated, I would never ask you to do it. Like uh, yes, <laughs> no, it's true. Your balloon Once on you... every patient? No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. So see. <laughs> That that actually is a very, very important point, Lou, uh, because, yeah. you know, being both we were both interested in transpulmonary pressure from before meeting each other. Um, and, you know, when you try to tell people the usefulness of it in the back of the mind, you're like, yeah, it's sometimes a pain in the ass, <laughs> like to put it bluntly. It's yeah. it can be challenging. And uh, sometimes if you're having difficulty inserting the catheter or you're not 100 percent sure of the position. Um, I have some data in in cadavers that shows the impact of airway closure on even doing the maneuver to check the position, what's called the modified mm -hmm. Bader maneuver, that airway closure can affect your accuracy of that. So you're having to manipulate the catheter trying to find the best position when it's because you have airway closure. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's really, there's so many things to consider. And for research, it's perfect because most people doing research understand all of this and we just put up with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the average clinician to be thrown in balloons and get numbers, it, it does become complicated. So something like airway opening pressure and recruitment to inflation ratio, the reason why I've been so attracted to these concepts is that it really, it, it brings these simple bedside tools of just manipulating your ventilator to get the information without needing fancy catheters uh, or, or the skill to do it. Um, so I recommend everyone check out um, the RT Maven website. I'll put it in the in the chat again for those who may have missed in the beginning. There's videos at the bottom that describe how to do this on a few different ventilators. You don't have to have a slow flow inflation curve. If you do, some ventilators like the G5 does not use flow. It uses changes in pressure, which may not be as accurate. So you should try to use 
slow flow inflation with the methods that we have there. Uh, I do know the dragger ventilator has a slow flow. You actually set the flow, so it would be okay. Knowing that your inflection would look different uh, on a pressure volume curve than it would on the pressure time. So if you learn the one skill of pressure time curve, what I just showed you the picture that someone sent me, if you learn that technique, it becomes very simple to do once you learn it on your ventilator. So obviously practice on your test lungs, don't practice on your patients. Uh, but once you become comfortable with it, it is a very, very easy tool uh, to use. So I don't see any more questions, uh, Lou, and I don't wanna take up any more of your time. I Truly, truly appreciate you coming on uh, for the last hour for this presentation. A little bit over, it's eight oh eight now, uh, but I'll no, let you I get back to your family. Very much, I, I like. Yeah, the thank questions. you so much. Yes. And so, in terms of uh, where to find you, uh, you're not on social media, so you can't find Lou anywhere. <laughs> yeah, if you have a, questions, yeah. If you have it's questions, not because for Lou, China banned uh, Facebook, so I don't have a Facebook uh, account. Many Chinese they have Facebook account. It's just my psychological problem. I, I don't like uh, connected too many doing my work. Yeah, and I, I prefer <laughs> focus. Enough. But if you have any question, um, send the email to me. It, it, it's, it's my great pleasure to, to respond. I may check. Uh, I usually check, uh, to be honest, respond to everything during two days. And then I, I, I focus. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So <laughs> what I'll do, Lou, just so you don't get so many people, we don't have to share your email on public uh, no, media. No, no, no. That's fine. That's fine. People, right? Yeah. So, well, people can also send a message to me and I can I can send them your email for, that, for them to contact you. If it's a simple question, I might be able to answer it. But if they have a question I can't yeah. answer, I'll send them your email. I'll re reply with their email. So people can send me a message from, on my Facebook page and then I can get them through to that. Um, so, and yeah, my, I think probably before your closing uh, last come. Uh, I know I, I, I published this R ratio and I see um, many people use it. Uh, um, I was very happy and a lot of uh, actually 10 public educations maybe on that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, um, we are on the way to prove this is a benefit. We think this is a very nice physiology too. We use it without a problem. But uh, yeah. every time you use it with conscience, uh, I mean with mm -hmm. conscience, uh, you should assess Caution, the, yeah. The, yeah, conscience. Thanks. Yeah. You should assess the effect of PEEP in different dimensions. For yes. example, hemodynamics. Yeah, it's not just one very, tool to exactly. set PEEP. You have to consider. Yeah. Hemod hemodynamically. Well, like we said, driving pressure, right? I've seen, exactly. I've Drive had a few pressure. patients. I've had a few patients with COVID that An obese were patient. recruitable. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we've had this discussion. Obese patients don't follow the rules of recruitment to inflation ratio. So, <laughs> uh, if your RA ratio says they're not recruitable, you still should try to increase PEEP and look at other measures, specifically driving pressure. No, it's just uh, driving pressure mechanism. works very well in obese patients, I find. Because mm -hmm. um, as you increase PEEP, your driving pressure reduces uh, and they, they really just receive the PEEP nicely. Um, but yeah, it's, it's more than just the RA ratio. So if someone's yeah. recruitable, I'll set them on a PEEP of 15, but if their plateau is 34 or 35, I'll reduce tidal volume, but to a certain extent, you know, I'm not going to go to three mils per kilo to get my plateau pressure. Sometimes you may have to actually reduce PEEP because despite recruitability, some areas of the lung are just over distended and you, we have to address it. Uh, the lung is very heterogeneous. So looking at one measure, you need to look at many things. So I think in closing measure airway opening pressure. Look at recruitment to inflation ratio and pay very close attention to driving pressure. And when they are breathing spontaneously, pay attention to P0.1 and try to do things to minimize it below four. Good summary. Uh, I think that summarizes time, good. If you have a question, send the picture to Tom. I know he always <laughs> showed me the waveforms and very excited. <laughs> yeah, I get I very excited when people send me waveforms. Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, thank you so much, Lou. Uh, I'll just sort of plug our blog for a moment. Uh, so for those who are interested in this type of material, um, you can check out our blog. It's at coemv.ca. I'll put it in the coemv.ca. You can go to that website and it's our blog. Um, right now there's a mechanical ventilation course coming up next week. And so, yeah, definitely check it out. Check out the blog. I'll continue to post interesting stuff. I'm probably going to host these videos. Um, I'll have to run it by the other editor. So I'm the editor of, of this blog, but I run everything by Dr. Burchard. Um, so I'll make sure he's okay with us posting this on the, on the blog. Otherwise, it will be on my Facebook page. Uh, thank you, everyone, for showing up. And thank you again, uh, Lou, for coming by. And I really appreciate it. This is my first guest appearance on my Facebook yeah, Live, you. and I plan to do many more. I'll have many other guests. So thank you so much and we'll sign off.